In 1984, Stan Sakai created the character Usagi Yojimbo for Dark Horse Comics. Me being about nine at the time, I had no idea that this character existed, but in around 1990, I got given a second-hand Commodore 64 with a bag full of games, and one of those games was Samurai Warrior, The Battles of Usagi Yojimbo, and I played it to death. It was one of my favorite games. So it turns out that everybody in the world knew about Usagi Yojimbo, Except for me, he had even been in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles as it was called in the UK, because they thought that ninja might be too violent a word. But I did have this game, and we're going to build this game into a cartridge. And we're going to do it, right now. Mark Fixes Stuff This video is sponsored by PCBWay. You can get an instant quote on a variety of services, or browse a library of talented makers' designs, add them to your cart, and have them delivered directly to your door. We're using this custom board designed by C64 Istanbul. You can find the details of this cartridge in the description below. The game was never released as a cartridge, so this is a PRG file conversion running on Marco Soliuk's Magic Desk Cartridge Project. Boards are available at PCBWay and feature just three integrated circuits, making it a great project for beginners. This position is for a 74LS02 Logic IC. This is a quad 2 input NOR gate. It's fairly common and easy to get hold of. There's also space for a 74LS273. This is an Octal D-Type flip-flop and can be harder to source right now. Finally, we'll need some space for the data itself and by far the biggest IC will be this EEPROM. We'll use this vintage 27C512 UV Arrays EEPROM. We can't solder into the sockets in this position so watch as I skillfully reorientate the board with my incredibly dexterous hands. Yes, I know you're jealous of my skills right now, YouTube. Oh yeah. We'll use a socket for the EEPROM in case the programming goes wrong, and it really might. This is a super cheap 28 pin dip socket. It's really nothing posh. I like to spread the legs on the socket so it doesn't drop out whilst I'm working. OK, so we're ready to solder. Let's get our tool hot and ready. I'm going to be using 340 degrees centigrade today. This is my usual preferred temperature. Hmm, I could do with cleaning my tip really. Gently clean the tip in the wire wool ball. Definitely don't let your mind drift to being outbid at the last minute on a Sam Coupe. Damn it! That's better. Next I like to prime the tip with a bit of fresh solder. Marvellous. We'll use a touch of juicy liquid flux today. I just like the way it smells. Touching the pad and the leg at the same time, we start to solder. Even with the new workbench set up, there's no getting away from the fact that I have to work around the camera. It does make me look a little bit clumsier than I am in real life. Only a little bit, mind you.
I actually love soldering. It's quite an easy thing to do as well, even though a lot of people seem to be afraid to try. With some decent solder and the right setup, it's a lot of fun and you can make some really cool little gadgets. Just quickly reflowing the joints is a habit I've gotten into. I don't like to heat the pins for too long in one go and this tidies them up. I've spotted a lead that I've missed as well. Oh dear. The new solder helps heat the pad and pin, making the solder run deeper into the wire because of convection. OK, so this socket is ready for our programmed EEPROM later. Next up are the logic chips. Because these are quite cheap, I won't be using sockets. Sockets can also develop issues over time. We will test the logic before we solder it in though. This is my knockoff TL866 Plus device. It's a knockoff, but it seems to work. It's a chip programmer, which is very versatile, and I can also test logic chips to make sure that they're working. Very, very handy indeed. In the XG Pro software, we select Logic Test and then type the series, i.e. 74, and the number. Here it's 02. Note that we leave out the two characters in the middle. We could also put the chip in the programmer and press Auto Find, but do be aware that it can match multiple logic types. Then we just press Test and it immediately checks all the vectors and tells us that testing is normal. So we know that our 0 02 is good barring any very weird problems. Now for the 74273. Pressing auto find this time returns just one search result. Annoyingly, we still need to go and type the logic series and number into the box though. Once again, we press test and we see that everything is normal. So, happy days. After testing, I'm happy to solder both of these logic chips into the board directly, but whilst we're here, why don't we program our EEPROM? I absolutely love how these old UV EEPROMs look, and to think that our 64K of data will fit into that tiny area. In the software, EEPROMs are called devices, and we know our device is a 27C512. We also know it's made by ST, and it's a 28-pin DIP package. I always like to do a blank check to make sure that the EEPROM is empty. It also checks that we have the right device type selected, which is really handy. With our EEPROM ready to go, it's time to load up our bin or binary file. Really, you're meant to generate your own Magic Desk compatible bin file using a Python script utility called Magic Desk Cartridge Generator by Marco Soljic. That's beyond the scope of my video, but a link is below to the GitHub. With the bin file loaded, I scroll down looking for readable text. That's usually a good sign that the binary data is OK. Ooh, a tokenized language tree. Looks memory efficient and hackable. I'm happy to burn this data to our EEPROM now. I've set the video to two times speed because it's a bit boring to watch otherwise. It 
takes about 30 seconds and then the data is written to our EEPROM. It then verifies the data in a single second and with that our EEPROM is ready. We've finished with our EEPROM burner now so let's get back to the other end of the workbench and get our logic chip soldered in. We'll use a little high temperature polyamide tape to stop our logic dropping out, an easier but more expensive route than spreading the legs. Once again we gently flux the pins and pads before soldering the logic into place. Flux is a top trick because it removes any impurities on the metal surfaces as you solder. I hope you're enjoying this video. I'm back after the fire that burned down my house and changed my life and I'm ready to make more content. If you'd like to and you're able to help support my work then click the link below to go to my Patreon. You'll get ad free versions of the videos, exclusive discord chat and your name at the end of the videos. I'll also love you loads and your support will free me up to make more content just like this. Time for that satisfying peel. Oh yeah. Next the 74273. Oh, that slipped in so easily. Incredible, Jeff. A touch more sticky Lucasade wrapper. And then we gently flux the pads and pins. At this point, definitely don't think about getting outbid on that 128K Spectrum on eBay. Ugh. Let's whip through these pins quickly. The golden rule of soldering is that solder flows towards heat due to, you guessed it, convection. To get a good solder joint, we need to touch the iron to the pad and the pin at the same time, heating them evenly. 340 degrees centigrade is a lot, so I don't want to dwell on one pad and pin for too long, mainly because I don't want to damage the component or overheat and delaminate the pad from the board. That's why I often go back to quickly reflow the pins afterwards. Satisfying peel. It's time for the EEPROM, but when I come to place it in, the legs are all splayed out and too wide for our DIP28 socket. This gives me a chance to do some product placement. Usually I push the legs flat on the desk, eyeballing and redoing it until I get them right, but this handy dandy dip chip straightener from Retro Rewind is the dog's danglies and gives a perfect result first time. Actually, Retro Rewind very kindly sent me a lot of cool tools and gadgets to help me rebuild after I lost everything, so please excuse this silly shout out and expect more gadgets featured by me from them in future. This chip straightener really does work well though. Look at that, the time saver. And with our part firmly inserted, let's slip over to the Commodore 64 and test it out. Nice to see that Terry and Dave are back from their three month tour of bringing humanitarian aid to the bars of Aya Napa. Terry's always looking down on Dave. Reaching around the rear, it takes a bit of blind fumbling, but eventually it slips tightly in.
that nervous smile barely hiding my relief that the cartridge works. And it works well. And the game is every bit as good as I remembered. Calm is your score which you can advance by helping the poor, giving them money or Ryo. You can't simply give away all your money though. You'll need some to buy food in towns and replenish your single life bar for battles with enemies like Ninja. I'm not very good at this anymore, but I am getting better. <laughs> so, was it worth making this cartridge? It cost a few pounds, and when you think about it, making a cartridge in this day and age is a bit of a nonsense, especially when you've got things like the awesome Kung Fu Flash from Kim Jorgensen, made by the future was 8-bit, and you could pretty much play anything you like from that. But, that being said, it was one of my favourite games back in the day, and now I have it on a little cartridge with a bunny on top. So make of that what you will. I've actually really enjoyed this little project and I hope that you've enjoyed it too. My channel is driven by my generous patrons, so if you'd like to help fund future stuff, then uh, click the link below. Otherwise, keep watching, sharing, all the usual stuff. I've had a great time. And uh, thanks to all these patrons who are appearing on the screen in the next couple of seconds. And whilst I do that, I think I'll probably play a bit more Usagi Yajimbo. Bye.